Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, thank you again so much for having me. Um, I don't often step onto a stage where I actually have to look at my audience in the eye. So this is a very uh, different experience. And again, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here speaking to you all this evening. Um, you really are the brightest and the best students in the country. And I'm sure you will all go on to do amazing things. It, these words sound really great, don't they? Um, they're supposed to make you feel good and actually do mean them. You all have so much potential to be exceptional, but these words also create an expectation, a pressure to be the best, to succeed, to win. This can motivate you, but it can also cripple you. I know this from my own life, and I want to talk to you all about this a little today. The term we use is burnout. You've probably heard it before. It simply means you expend more energy and resources, emotional, physical, or both, um, than you have to give. Then an off switch kicks in, and you find at the moment when you need to perform at your best, it just isn't there. You have no more to give. It's happened to me in many different ways throughout my career so far. It has sometimes come after a period of success, other times after a time of struggle. It can knock you down for a day or two or completely knock you out cold for months. I've experienced both. An example, a most recent example of this for me was actually my season in 2017. I had my most successful first six months um, of a season to date. I made it to the quarterfinals of the Australian Open. I won two titles in those first six months, one of them being Miami, um, the biggest title of my career to date. And I followed this up by making it to the semi-finals of Wimbledon, um, after which I achieved my career high ranking so far of number four in the world. I mean, that's a pretty great six months, um, if I say so myself. <laughs> and then I experienced my own off switch and I found that I simply couldn't tolerate. Now, as a professional athlete and as a tennis player, every time you step out onto the court, you accept to be made to feel uncomfortable. Your opponent is there to do that, and equally as I am there to do that. And I found that both on court and off court, I simply couldn't tolerate the stress. I couldn't tolerate the expectation, my own external. And I just basically had no more to give. Now, during this period, what I really learned was that experience, which unfortunately only comes with time, is what has helped me and continues to help me to understand myself better so I can preempt, manage and pick myself back up when it does happen. Ultimately, I do believe it's unavoidable. Today's society of constant demand to be the best, look the best, sound the best, perform the best, be everything the best, makes sure of this. If you are in the pursuit of excellence in your field, your biggest asset will be your perseverance. In the world, sorry, in the world of sport, and in my case, tennis, perseverance comes through in its rawest form. You quite literally just have to be stronger, high performing physically, mentally, emotionally than your opponent. That has a cost and I can track it back through my career. It's heartbreaking when you realize you have pushed it too, too far and you need to stop, regroup, self-nurture, rest, and remind yourself to put it all in perspective. That can be very hard to do sometimes. My passion for my sport and my desire to bring the most out of myself is ultimately what has kept me playing. I've had plenty of opportunities to quit, definitely more than I have had to succeed. But because I've had an unwavering, unconditional love for my sport, that the only option that made sense was for me to keep going. This is also ironically where the pressure comes from. It's not just external from competitors, media, fans, but it's also from within yourself because passion drives the desire to do your best. 
the biggest thing I have learned is that I need to be proud of who I am and not what I have done. And trust me, that's a lot, e lot easier said than done. I have a childhood dream of becoming number one in the world, winning all four Grand Slam twice, and while we're at it, let's add a gold medal or two. I promise you, it still is, and I work towards that every single day. However, I've discovered that my priority in life has to be my happiness. And this happiness to be in place regardless of whether my childhood dream comes true or not. If you are proud, and quite frankly, however cheesy it sounds, love who you are, then the results of your hard work will not be where your satisfaction comes from. It will be the work, the blood, the sweat, the tears you put in that at the end of the day will, will make you feel proud of yourself, will make you keep you standing tall. The world judges people too quickly, arbitrarily, and often way too harshly on the outcome. But if you are judging yourself by the daily application of the work you put in, and you take responsibility for that work to be done, because there are definitely no shortcuts, and you continue to remember to be kind and nurturing to yourself along the way, then you give yourself the best chance of achieving the results that you want. And you do this without hurting yourself in the process. This process to me was my own personal growth. And I promise you it continues to this day and will continue on for the rest of my career and whatever comes next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. can breathe now. That's very nerve-wracking, I promise you. Like I said, I'm, I'm used to even on court interviews, but having given a speech, I mean, I haven't done that in a very, very, very long time, let's just say. <laughs> so, ooh, I'm very, I feel quite proud of myself there, <laughs> if I say so myself. <laughs> we'll start with a few questions from me, and then, like I said, we'll move yes. out to the audience. Um, so if we start at the beginning, when was it that you first knew that you wanted to play tennis professionally? And was that a scary decision to make? Were you considering other things at the time? Um, well, I started playing when I was about seven, eight years old. Although I'd been around the sport, my mum played, my mum's brother, uncle plays to this day. So I had been around the sport before, but I started playing when I was seven, eight. And from what I remember, and actually from what my parents tell me, because I don't remember much, um, I didn't actually really enjoy going training, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it was always very important in my family for me to be active, for, for the sport to be a part of our lives. Um, it was about getting me physically developed in a healthy way. And it was not until I played my first weekend tournament where I got the bug. And at the age of nine, I decided I want to be number one in the world. And that was that. Now, a lot has happened in between then and now. A lot of, uh, a lot of sacrifice from myself and in particular my parents to enable me to have this opportunity to pursue my dream, because that's what it is. And uh, I've completely lost now track of what the question was. <laughs> Just basically, <laughs> when, when did you decide that you wanted to play professionally? Nine. Nine. Nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> Your playing style has been described as focused on offensive baseline play. Mm -hmm. Was this something that came quite naturally to you, or was it something that you learned through coaching and through training? I think a combination. I do think a player's game style is very also true to their personality. Now, I'm not sure if that means I'm an offensive person. <laughs> Who knows, we'll see how this goes. Um, but uh, I definitely am someone who, who likes to be in control, who likes to dictate, and I think that definitely comes through in, in, my, in my playing style. Then, ultimately, obviously, the coaching you receive um, also enables you to hone in those skills that you naturally possess, um, like all players do. 
Um, so I, yeah, I definitely think it was a combination. A combination. Yeah. And we touched on your coaching there. So you've been trained in Barcelona, Texas, England, and you've experienced sort of a range of international styles. Has that impacted the way you play today? And have you sort of incorporated the diverse strategies used or is it always just been similar, the same? Ooh. I mean, I think that ultimately is the question of whether, whether your environment has an effect on you. Yeah. Um, and I can't really answer that because I would assume so, mm. um, because who knows how I would be playing or who I would be if I hadn't been in those situations, experienced those things. Um, I think I definitely learned a lot of different schooling methods, mm. in, in to, so to speak. In Spain, they're very well known for drilling, for lots of repetition, for um, basically that that's the Spanish school or Spanish school of tennis, so lots of repetition. Um, American tennis schooling is much more on hitting big, going for big shots, um, making it look wow. <laughs> I'm not sure if I do either. <laughs> I think I maybe fell somewhere in between. I mean. My parents think I'm wow sometimes on court, sometimes not. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I definitely think I, I I took a number of different things from from the multiple places that I've trained. Um, but ultimately, also as as a player, you do inevitably start to travel the world um, for competitions. Um, if you if you're looking to to become a professional tennis player, you have to do that. It, it's part of it's part of the job. Um, and I think through that exposure you come into contact with so many different styles of players as well that I think you 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 pick that up it's a very global sport tennis actually I think also makes it very special it, it really is um, players from all corners of the world and you said you were nervous doing your speech very. um it must be a very nerve-wracking it's obviously a very nerve-wracking game when you were facing Simona Halep in uh, Miami you were just sort of she was two points away from victory um, and you eventually went on to win all three sets. What were you thinking? Were you sort of playing it point by point or were you thinking about the end of the game all the time? How does it feel actually being in that situation? Um, I think um, when you step out onto the, onto the court, you, expo you accept the, respons the responsibility that you are going to be playing against someone else who is out there to win, like you. And and it's going to be a tussle. There's going to be an arm wrestle. It's it's your you're, you're going to go out there with your apparel and your your game plan and and your plan B and plan C and plan everything, and you're going to throw everything at them, including the kitchen sink, and you're going to try and come out on top. But then your opponent's going to do exactly the same thing. So you're going to find that there will be times in a match where it looks more like you're going to lose than you're going to win. And that's when you have the opportunity to surprise yourself with how you handle that situation. So if you are two points away from losing a match, you might lose it. But A, you want your opponent to win it, first of all. And if they do, well done, you deserve that. I'll get you next time. Or, you know what, I can show my strength of character, how brave I can be. And, and you know what, I, I can still come through this, why not? Um, they always say, you know, it isn't over until the fat lady sings or until you shake hands. And I mean, to be fair, that's very true. It's not over until you shake hands. And if you have enough clarity of mind to keep that in perspective and you're clear on what you're doing and you trust that, um, then it doesn't matter if you're two points away from winning or losing, you should be approaching each point in the same way. So it's sort of about keeping your composure. Definitely keeping composure and, and keeping good perspective and, and keeping, I mean, it definitely s sounds a lot easier than done, a clear head. I mean, how many things, how many stressful situations, how many really just, yeah, difficult situations we experience where all we really want is a clear head to be able to just really um, find the best way out possible. And, and that definitely comes through in a very raw form in sport and in tennis when it's very active chess. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought we could finish on the issue um, of equal pay in tennis and mm -hmm. in sport more widely. I know you've been an advocate of this. Can you tell us how much opposition you actually face with this and um, what that's like? Um, I mean, I have a fundamental belief that 
if a man or a woman does the same job, they should get paid equally for, for that job. Um, I think there's a lot of external issues that, that encompass equal pay. Um, there's a lot of different opinions. Um, and I, I feel that as long as we keep making the stride to make that known that if I do the same job as my, my male counterpart that I should get paid equally for it. Um, I think it's been the biggest topic of conversation in Grand Slams, um, which is actually ironic because I don't feel that actually the major issue is there. Um, in our case, in, in tennis, the the way the wages work and the, the way the tournaments work and prize money, because that's where we, we get we get our paycheck in the end. The the men have a many much, much more opportunities to compete. They have a lot more tournaments, so to speak. And the um, amount of money that is made available in those tournaments are a lot higher. Now there's a lot of arguments for why that is, and some I'm I'm sure are true. Um, but at the end of the day, we obviously take home a lot less than the men do, um, which can be sometimes hard because in those tournaments, the men play best of three sets. So the biggest argument that comes up is men play best of five in slams, women play best of three, men should get paid more. On paper, I actually agree with that. I think, okay, the men, you're playing more than us, then yeah, you should be paid for more. I, I fundamentally believe that we should get paid equally for the same work. If you're doing more work, yeah, get paid more. However, people don't always take into account that matches aren't also counted on sets, they're also counted on time. Now, I've played plenty of three hour, three and a half hour matches in my time, best of three sets, and the men have finished their match in two hours, best of five. So I think there's, that also needs to be taken into account that it's, you know, it's, it's not all about how many sets you're playing, but let's then look at the court time. Let's look at how much, yeah, how much value the fans are getting. At the end of the day, it's, it's the, the money that the fans bring in, the spectators that also bring in, uh, bring in the money. Um, so I, I sit on the fence with that in that perspective, um, but also I think why the men have a lot more resource available is also the way culture is around female sport. I think it's changing. However, I think um, sport was always very much a masculine industry. I mean, it still is mainly. I mean, first of all, tennis is not heard of in this country, except in the summer. <laughs> There's football and rugby. We all know that. I follow too. Okay. Um, but definitely, I think uh, just bringing that awareness and actually making it okay, making it exciting, the fact that women can play sport and women can play sport well and entertain, it's entertainment. I think, I didn't answer that question, mm -hmm. but I hope it answered it a little. <laughs> no, it definitely did. Where do you think, where do you think the bulk of the opposition comes for, from? Do you think it's more specifically players or the people organizing the competitions or do you think it's a more societal aversion to equal pay in sport for women? Um, to be honest, whenever you hear the men speak up about it, they're never actually speaking up against the women. I find they're actually more speaking up, speaking up for themselves, which I actually have no problem with. Um, I think um, we've been very fortunate in the women's game to have people like Billie Jean King who are equally outspoken for our rights. And I believe the men have the same and they should have the same. So I think it's very much an image thing. It's a thing, it's a very societal thing. I think. Um, like I said, through history, t uh, sport has been very much a masculine thing, so I think everyone's more accustomed to putting more money behind ma male sport. I think that is changing, but like all change, it can be slow, and there's always going to be hiccups along the way. Um, but I know for a fact that people enjoy to watch me play, and I work very hard to go out onto the court and entertain the audience that has come to watch me play. So I, I think as long as we keep approaching our profession in that way, slowly but surely, I think it'll be recognized and the culture will change.
I mean, I trust in that. Maybe not in my lifetime, maybe my grandkids, who knows. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll move to audience questions now. So if you just want to raise your hand if you have a question. Can we go to the gentleman in the front? If you want to just wait for the microphone to get to you. Thank you for your talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I figured I was okay, actually. <laughs> I'll need feedback at the end. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, you've got many years of your career left, but when you look back on it, what kind of legacy mm. would you like to leave um, on the spot? <sighs> um, I think I'd... Oh, okay. Let me think for a second. I've always approached my sport in the most professional manner that I can. So I would like to, when I come into contact with young players um, here in the country or overseas, um, we have a lot of young kids that come watch tournaments. I'd, I'd like to think that I'm responsible to a certain extent to either igniting a passion in someone or keeping a passion alive in someone. Um, I think I've had, and I actually touched on this, I've, I've had a lot of times in my career where my passion dwindled and I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't really know how to keep going. All I know is that I wanted to, but I didn't really know how, if I could, what was going to happen. Um, so I definitely would love to have an impact on, on people's lives who love the sport or who have a passion for something that they can draw from the struggles that I had or the doubts that I had and basically just help them persevere. I don't know if that's a, a legacy or not, but I'd, I'd, yeah, that's what I'd, I'd like to be able to do. Yeah. <laughs> Can we have the next question, please? Can we go to, yeah, the hand? <coughs> I'm curious how you handle relationships with other players on the tour, and is there a concern, like if you get to be friends with somebody, does it make it harder when you go out and you have to play against them? So do you try to hold back sometimes in relationships? Um, I think, um, I mean, it's all very individual. I'm quite a bubbly person. I always say hello. I, I will always ask people how they are, and I will always ask, I mean, now recently, since I've got a dog, I always tell them, you want to see a picture of my dog, he's very cute. Um, so I, and I always, I have a very strict, I don't know if it's the word, but I have a very, um, let's use strict, because I can't find anything else. When I step out onto the court, I'm there to compete against the person, but the competition is on the court. When I step off, I'm not competing. I'm. I'm there looking after my body, I'm there to enjoy the food, I'm there to enjoy some conversation, I'm there to, to um, enjoy the life that I live um, and prepare for my, for my competitive sport, for my match. But the competition against an individual, against someone else is purely on the court. And I don't look to, to really replicate that off it because uh, I think it takes enough out of you on court that if I lived in a constant, yeah, constant bubble of just competing against everybody off the court as well, I mean, I probably would have quit five years ago, 15 even. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, that, that's not something that works for me. However, that's how I approach my career. And that's, I know what creates a nice balance for me to be able to compete well on court and to be able to remain a happy person other players need a constant competition. Others, so it, it's. I think it very, it very much differs with each individual. Okay, thank you. The next question, please. Can we have the hand at the back? Hi, Joanna. Um, Hi. Enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, apologies, I think this subject has been beaten to death already, but I've got a question with regards to the US Open final of okay. Naomi Osaka versus Serena Williams. Um, first of all, from a black and white rules, pers black on white rules pers perspective, was the chair umpire wrong or right? And then secondly, if you wouldn't mind sharing your personal opinion about what happened there. 
Don't worry, I'm used to beating to death questions. I mean, I, we travel with media that literally ask me the same question every single week. So I'll find a creative way to <laughs> answer. I mean, <coughs> <sighs> Whew, that's, a, that's, a, that's an explosive topic. Um, I need to remain politically correct now. Um, I, think, I think there's a number of different elements that need to be taken into perspective. Um, no, into perspective, into account, sorry, into account. And one of them being um, the umpire was right. The um, Patrick Marshall was coaching, he said so. Um, he gave a coaching violation. Um, I think that has to be taken separately to then what happened after. Um, now, one thing that is 100% for certain is that emotions are always incredibly high in a match. And I would, I would imagine so because I've never been in a Grand Slam final, um, but definitely more so in a Grand Slam final. And everybody's human, including Serena Williams. Um, and I think the US Open just brings it out of her. I mean, she's been disqualified once before at the same <laughs> event, so bless her. I think she, I think she feels, I think she feels, uh, she feels the stress there, that's for sure. However, I think you've also then got to look at the umpire. Uh, th that specific umpire is a stickler for the rules. And he gave, he gave coaching violations to Djokovic, to Nadal, in different slams. Now, I, I think, like I said, I'm all for equal rights, but I am for equal rights. So I don't necessarily always agree when you don't like something, you brush it onto the inequality carpet and you say, it's because I'm a woman, I didn't get this or I, I don't necessarily always agree with that approach. I think, I think if you would look at the umpire's history and if that would stand out, then yeah, there's an <laughs> argument to that. But actually, I think they took the stats of specifically the US Open and the men actually got significantly more violations, codes than the women. The women are just better behaved, obviously. Um, However, one thing you cannot take away from Serena is how passionate she is about women's rights. And it is because of people like her and Billie Jean King, who I've mentioned before, that conversations are started, topics are put in the forefront, and change can be made. Now, I don't believe that was a sexist issue, personally. I believe it was emotions running high and things, and things just snowballing. Um, that's, that's what I believe. Don't hate me, Serena. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's always a really tough topic because everyone's got their own opinion. And I truly believe that what's good about democracy is that you listen to your neighbor's opinion and if you don't like it, you accept that and you move on. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if I answered the question. I try to answer it as unexplosively as possible. I think you were very diplomatic in the way you answered Well, <laughs> kind of, well, I mean, obviously, I, I, I mean, I, I think I stuck to my opinion because that is my opinion. Um, but yeah, I think, probably spoken about this topic a lot more passionately with a lot of different words before, <laughs> not in this context, so. <laughs> Can we take another question? Yeah. Uh, so being British number one and obviously having like an exciting game style that brings you fans, have you had any kind of weird or uh, fan encounters that stick out to you? Oh, weird and wonderful. I mean, uh, bless her heart. I don't want to categorize her as weird. I just say, no, no, not funny. I would say she is just very enthusiastic. I have, 
a fan account, a fan page in China. <laughs> I'm big in China, guys. Um, and this, this girl, I think she's my age, so a woman, although girl, I call myself. And she comes to every tournament that I play in China. She brings me gifts. Oh my gosh, I got a pillow with my head on it. <laughs> I've gotten, I got a puzzle this year, an actual puzzle of me holding the Miami Trophy. All these gifts are with my parents. They enjoy them, right, mom, dad? You're like, yes, yeah. Um, but so I think she definitely takes the crown of just best fan. However, I then have another fan account holder, because I'm just a big deal. <laughs> and this fan account holder is in France, and she, I kid you not, is probably my biggest vocal supporter I've ever had. I think she supports me more than my parents. I think she, she supports me more than myself, than I do myself. Every day, or when I've lost a match, all I get from her is, we love you, you are such an inspiration, keep working hard, and honestly, I just, I feel so much better about life. Just the fact that she exists and has this fan account. So I think those two take just the best fan awards. Now, Weird and Wonderful, um, my partner, he, he helps me manage my social media, so he gets to filter through a lot of the, uh, the Weird and Wonderful. So I had, I had one gentleman, we think, we never know, on social media, who knows, um, who I'm pretty sure would propose to me. I'm pretty sure, I mean, I can't guarantee, but I definitely got the feeling that things were going somewhere. <laughs> it never evolved. I think Jackson's happy about that in the back, but... Is that when he took over the social media? That's when, he, that's when he took over the social media and I'm, I'm on a short leash now, so... Yeah. Can we take another question? Um, yeah, hand here. Um, there's obviously a big problem with girls taking part in sport, generally, um, and also tennis specifically. What inspired you when you were younger and how can we encourage girls to take part? So I grew up in a household where we have two rules. Number one, mum is always right. Number two, in the instant that she's not right, number w rule number one comes into effect. Mm -hmm. So there was never really a, a feeling that I couldn't do something because I was a girl, because let's be honest, dad was outnumbered always. Um, so my parents loved sport, can love sport to this day. It was always going to be and I was always going to have the opportunity to play sport because they wanted it for me and I'm forever grateful that they did. Um, and because I was growing up in that environment with them, when my passion for my sport progressed um, into something bigger, into a bigger dream, I never hit an obstacle or a hurdle from them. And definitely in the first part of my life, they're my biggest influence. Um, so I was always supported in this passion and I, I count myself very lucky for that. Now I know not all girls get that opportunity um, and I think as we grow awareness for the wonderful things that women in sport can do and can achieve and that can bring to the table and that can entertain, I think that will give a bigger platform for young girls to see role models, to, to see opportunity in, in that field, in that work, in, in that passion. And I think it hopefully will keep girls in sport for longer um, because it's nurtured, because it's, it's encouraged. Um, I try to do that with whenever I see young girls or see girls playing. Um, whenever I meet them. Um, but definitely, I think, um, creating a more acceptance of women in sport and the fact that it's an amazing thing, I think will also educate a lot of parents to, whether they want to or not, encourage them, encourage their kids to, girls to get into sport, I think. Can I take another question? Yeah, just right next to you. If there's one rule you could change about tennis, what would it be and why? 
I mean, I always get time violations. I mean, all the time. I just, I, I'm a really prompt person, but I guess not in tennis. I'm always late. So I would love for it to just, can I take my time? Can I literally just take my time? Um, but any other rules specifically? To be honest, I love tradition. I am... Um, uh, yeah, I love routine, love tradition. So I wouldn't actually necessarily change a lot of rules when a lot of rule conversations come up. I'm always usually for, no, keep it as it is. It's wonderful. No, why would you change it? Um, so actually, I don't know. But besides the one that affects me personally, I feel quite passionately about <laughs> because the amount of conversations I have with umpires are really four seconds, really OK. Um, otherwise, no. <laughs> Can we take another question? Yeah. Um, if you didn't, if your professional tennis career hadn't turned out as it did, where, where do you think you would have ended up? Comedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, unlikely, actually. Um, singing, no. Terrible voice, good stage presence. Um, well, if you ask my parents, or specifically my mum, she'd say I've, I would be an actress. <laughs> Obviously, I think everyone gets called an actress at home by their parents at some point or another. Um, well, you see, I went through these stages where I watched Legally Blonde and then I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I watched Grey's Anatomy and I wanted to be a doctor. So, it, no, to be honest, I think... That's enough joking, cheese. Um, I think I... Do you know what I don't know? Um, I was always so passionate about my sport that I never really saw another option. I never really wanted to see another option, to be fair. I'm reasonably bright, so I think I could have found, I mean, knock on wood if I say so myself, mm -hmm. I could have found another avenue to put my passion into, but I never nurtured that to, to the extent that probably would be needed to find another passion. I never looked for it. Um, so tennis really was what I wanted to and want to succeed in. Um, now after tennis, because I can't play forever, apparently, um, I eat really well. Like I eat a lot. I just, I know how to eat well. Not well as in like good, like healthy food. I just, I'm good at eating. <laughs> so I, I'm looking for opportunities on, in that career path, to be honest. I mean, food critic. I mean, if people just want to pay me to eat, <laughs> I don't mind. Um, but yeah, no, I'm definitely interested in um, the food industry. Um, yeah, I think I'll be heading into setting, trying to set that up for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever enjoy watching another sport or um, find inspiration from an athlete watching a different sport than tennis? So I am a professional athlete. Right, 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 right. I am probably the least sporty sportswoman that you'll ever meet. I just don't follow other sports. I literally don't. And it's not because I haven't any interest. I just having any interest actually. Um, however, when the Olympics roll around, I am the most sport mad fanatic you will ever see. I, I just, I get so engrossed in, in the Olympic Games every time that that's when I, I really get involved in stories of, of people's triumphs, of their, how they came, overcame hardship, and I really kind of live my own journey through them, and it's, yeah, builds up into a very emotional two weeks. Um, but outside of that, I never really idolized an athlete or idolized a specific person or, or looked up to anyone, really, actually, which is really bad. I didn't. It's not very good, um, but yeah, I got. I mean, I got very personally invested in Phelps in London 2012. I I actually felt that if I didn't watch every race, that he might lose because obviously <coughs> you would be superstitious. Because if you're not there, 
And I was in Canada at the time, actually, playing a challenger in Vancouver. And I was staying with a, um, a host family. And I was in their basement, uh, like, video room or... Video room? Oh, my God, how old am I? <laughs> TV room. Um, I was there every race. Forget about the challenger that I was playing. No, <laughs> Phelps was swimming. I had a crush on him. It helped. Um, yeah. And then to be fair, I've never been, so I played, I, I took part in Rio 2016. So it was the first time I was an Olympian. And so I told you this whole story now, right, of me getting invested in the Olympics, watching. When it came around that I got to be a part of the Olympics, I was such a baby because I didn't want to go because firstly in tennis there's no prize money, there's no points and I was there thinking I'm having such a good year, why am I going to the Olympics, there's nothing in it for me. Honestly, how spoilt of a brat, <laughs> jeez. And I went and it was the best two weeks of my life. I was surrounded by athletes who were like me, who so slightly socially awkward, you know, didn't really know how to act. And I got to just immerse myself in just athletes. It was incredible. I was like, wow, I got to see them train. Um, I went to the British school, which was set up for the British athletes. And there were boxers there, there were rugby players. There were, I mean, honestly, it was, I was just watching in awe the swimmers. There was, um, the, I got to know the hockey players, the divers, and just to see them, how they were going about their training, their being, just how they were, honestly, I completely gone away from your question, but I just felt like I wanted to share that because best experience of my life. So since then, I still don't follow sports, but I'm still in love with the Olympics. The end. Sorry, just went off on a tangent. Can we take, yeah. Um, I like the uh, topic of your speech because I think it has universal application mm -hmm. and it'd be interesting because we're also often told how at the top of the game the mental part is very important. Yes. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that and perhaps how you've managed to lift yourself out of, uh, you know, dips in, in your mental <coughs> positions. Um, I think mental, str mental strength is a very broad term. I think there's a lot of different aspects to mental strength um, and to strength in general. I, I think for me, the first step in, in finding strength in my mental capacity was becoming self-aware, um, getting to know myself better, getting to know myself to the extent that I knew how certain situations would affect me. I knew how I would react um, in those situations, basically. And I think once you, you are able to view yourself from a little bit of a third person pers perspective from a bird's eye view of, of okay, what's going on here? This, this is the situation, how am I reacting to this? I think then you start giving yourself the opportunity to equip yourself with tools to manage. Um, I think no one is feeling unbelievable in stressful situations on court. I'm not out there, even when I'm feeling my, my my most strong. I'm not like Zen. I, I like to think that you're in constant movement. And I think it's learning to, ex it's learning, it's just <coughs> learning that emotions, they're, they're not fixed. Um, situations, they're not fixed. Everything is, is going to continue moving along as well. And I think if you accept that, then you know that it's actually not life threatening. It's, it's, not, it's not something um, that will be the be all end all in my, situ in my, in, in my perspective for tennis. If, there's, if I've had a bad game, a bad point, a bad set, a bad match, even, even if I lost it, you know what, actually things keep going, it's fine. This is not a constant state of being. I'm not gonna feel like this forever. It's like a bad breakup. You're not gonna feel crap forever. And I think 
learning that and accepting that it also takes strength and it takes some um, sorry it takes um, the potency out of emotions they don't they don't stay as strong they don't stay as overwhelming um, and I think you're actually able to move on to the easier stuff as well did I answer that or was that well, a really roundabout way how important okay. do you think it is at the, at the top level the mental strength sorry how important is the mental strength at the top level of the game um, I think uh, I think it's probably the most important. Um, once you get to the elite level of your sport or, or wh whatever, I think everybody is there with talent, with gifts. I think everyone, in my case, everyone can hit a backhand, a forehand, a serve. Everyone can move to a certain extent. Everyone. So then you are looking to maximise what you have and definitely your ability to tolerate and your ability to to be on court and roll with the punches quite frankly i think uh you um you're always playing chicken with the other player i mean who you know who's gonna who's gonna completely just throw in the towel first and when no one throws in the towel that's when epic matches happen and that's why you see epic battles between Roger and um, Nadal. And you see them with Djokovic and you see them with Andy, because no one's throwing in the towel there. No one's, because they're, they're all at the mental capacity where they know themselves. They've been in that situation before. They, they accept the outcome. They accept that they might lose, they might win, but they're there to, to perform at the highest level and to, to show what they can do. So I think, and if you get yourself to a state where your mentality is is kind of just your cheerleader and your bo your bodyguard, it's there with you, then you can let your your game play. Can we hear the hand at the back? Um, hi, Joanna. Thanks so much oh. for coming today. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, big question. This. Um, what do you think is the greatest achievement? by a man or woman in the history of the sport? Oh, I mean, then, I mean, you have achievement in, in just pure results. Um, I mean, the most successful player, I mean, ever, I think is Serena, although Margaret Court still holds more titles and I know Serena's working very hard to to do something about that um, so there's an there's a result side of success um, but then I think it's also personal journeys um, the amount of stories you hear of of people overcoming in kind of incredible odds and and actually putting themselves out there being vulnerable and putting themselves out there and 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 being something which no one thought they could be, but only them and the closest around them. I think that is success. I think success is a very personal journey. I think you can be very successful um, in life and in, in, in happiness in how you are without having 25 grand slams or 15 gold medals or I think, and. I think actually those people also tell you that they didn't necessarily find their success in those trophies, that they found it within themselves, within their environment, within their beliefs, within just themselves. So for me, that's what I consider success. It's, it's your own personal success of what, what, what it means for you, basically. I think we have time for one last question. That was such a good one to end on, though. I felt so inspired. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we go to the gentleman on the third row? Hi, Jonna. Hi. Um, does your approach to your game um, change, uh, well, in terms of intensity, change depending on the match? So, for example, would you approach a quarterfinal match uh, in the Grand Slam differently to, say, a first round match? Um, or are you all out all the time? I mean, I think you've gathered from my personality, I'm basically just all out, all the time. Um, but I think inevitably there's gonna be certain, the emotions will be different in the two situations. However, actually 
first rounds are generally more difficult than quarterfinals. Um, there's, you always have to play yourself into tournaments as well and into matches um, to find your rhythm, to basically find your routine, to just get into that kind of headspace. So first matches are always difficult because no matter your level or your ranking, you are all starting from zero and you are all trying to find your best level in that situation in that first round. I think what I've tried to do and what I, what I, I feel I actually do, um, if I say so myself, I, I, I do approach every match equally. Um, I think that was an important lesson for me to learn also when I was younger, when I was playing the smaller events that I didn't devalue them, that I didn't, I didn't look down on them, and that I appreciated every opportunity that I got to compete, every match that I got to play. And that was every round. And that was when I was uh, playing in, I mean, in some places that I would literally have never gone otherwise. So to answer your question, I think it's important to, to approach every match the same. Um, However, emotions will inevitably be different. There might be more exciting, more, exci more excitement in some, more nerves in others. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Could everyone join me in thanking Joanna Conta for being with us today?